here's, here's what we're going to do, guys. Uh, I told you this week we're, we're doing this series called Identity Crisis, but originally I had planned, I, I go on a prayer retreat every year, map out the, the coming year, um, and I, I plan on doing a mini-series on finance and generosity, and I went on my prayer retreat again this uh, month or a month ago, and, and I came back feeling like I need to postpone that and wait till next year, and, and so instead we're doing this series we're kicking off today called Identity Crisis, which is why I loved the song selection today, because I think we sang a lot about who we are, who God is, who we are in God, and here's, here's the deal. I'm, I've been growing in my concern for us when it comes to, to this I, idea of identity because our world is full of targeted confusion designed to lead you away from Jesus. And more and more people probably that, that I know, that, that you know, have walked away from Jesus and the church. And and I think it starts with this idea of who God is and, and who we are, and it starts with your identity, and, and it starts with an enemy that wants to steal your identity, uh, to kill your God-given, God-given identity, and to destroy you in the process. And, and so that's what Jesus said the enemy comes to do. And, and so, so I don't want that for you. I want what Jesus has for us, which is life and life to the fullest, and And so before we kind of jump into this series, uh, I'll just throw this out. Some content this morning might not be suitable for young kids. Uh, There are parts of the Bible that aren't super suitable for young kids. Um, Little, little kids are fine. Um, I I heard her back there. She says, how about me? Two-year-olds, you're fine. Uh, You're like a a 7 to 11-year-old. Maybe they'll have enough understanding um, about some of the the issues we're going to cover in the Bible today. So um, we have a great kids ministry. So I just encourage you, you can pop them on over there and they would love to have you over there if you have kids in here like that today or any week. We have a great kids ministry. Otherwise, uh, let's jump in. A while back, I went wallet shopping. Do you, does anyone still, everyone still have wallets? Is that still a thing? We're, we're still a wallet society. I don't know if everything's digital yet, if you're just using Bitcoin for everything or, or whatever, but I still use a wallet. And uh, I used to have a traditional Versace leather wallet that when I worked at Sears uh, 20 some odd years ago, uh, a customer that I helped gave me this Versace wallet and it had this like Versace emblem that came out of the leather and would like rip a hole in all my pockets of, of all my pants. But, but this was gifted to me and, and so I would fill it with every receipt. I didn't even like track my finances back then. I just put receipts into this wallet and, and I'd fill it with every kind of thing that would have. And, and eventually a chiropractor told me it was shifting my spine uh, which was also the premise of a Seinfeld episode, which made me really happy. I was like, yes, this is real life, and I get to live this out. And, and so I kept this wallet after the chiropractor said, hey, you shouldn't be sitting on this you know, phone book uh, in, your, in your pocket. So all I, I just stopped putting it in my pocket, and then I would lose it all the time. Now today, I will tell you, I would lose it all the time. Back then, Amanda lost it all the time. Um, like I, I would just not be able to find it. And I said, well, I know where I put it, but you must have moved it. Um, now I know probably I was just losing it. And um, you know what? I, I wish they made like, like a handbag of some sort that you could put your things into when you went out on the town. Um, you know, uh, ladies have that, um, but there's nothing for me. You just got to shove this stuff in your pockets. And, and so eventually I decided it was time for a new wallet a minimalist wallet. And so I searched all through the store. Um, It's an internet emporium you may have heard of called Amazon. And as I browsed the aisles on my screen uh, for, for what I wanted by searching minimalist wallet, you know what I found? I found that most wallets these days come equipped with an RFID blocking technology to keep bandits with scanners from walking past you and stealing your identity and your credit card information. Now, I don't think this is a real thing. Has anyone in here had anyone pick their pocket digitally by walking past you with the scanner and stealing your credit card information? 
Not one. Good. Um, every wallet that you look for has this technology. No one knows anyone who's ever been scammed in this way, but it's the only way that you can buy a wallet now on Amazon. And, and so I tried to find a wallet without this technology, and I couldn't. And so now I have a minimalist wallet that secures my identity from criminals that probably don't exist. Now, when it comes to your identity... As your pastor, uh, I believe it's my job to provide this infrared protection for you, but spiritually, because there is an actual enemy that does want to steal from you and, and kill you and destroy you. And, and, and so you might not think you need it, just like I don't think I need it, but someone somewhere decided that your wallet needs this kind of protection. And the Bible decided that we need a type of protection in our lives as well. And so in this series, we're going to build each week. And, and so you want to be here every single Sunday for the next three Sundays after today, especially next week. It's chili cook-off. We got baptisms. It's going to be an exciting one. But, but we're going to build layer by layer over the next four weeks on, on this topic of your identity in Christ. And, and so let me preface this for you. This week is the dark week. Uh, it, it's kind of a little bit harder, it's a little bit more of a, a bummer, and uh, it's the bad news, it's the harsh reality, it's the tough truth about the attack on your identity, but you're already here, so um, you might as, well, might as well sit through that, and then come back, because in the, the coming weeks, uh, if you stick with me, starting next Sunday, we're going to talk about some things that are like sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, and, and all of that good stuff, and uh, there might still be some other, other stuff in those weeks, but, but those ones will be easier. So, so bear with me as we launch the series today, because your identity is under attack. If you don't have a solid foundation in Jesus, this is a battle that you will lose. Time and time again, I've, I've seen people, solid, seemingly solid Christians, turn away from Jesus and, and not return. And, and so before we get into the Bible uh, and your identity in Christ, I want to caution you to be aware of something that's pervasive in our culture today. I think we have a short video clip. I by the same man. I by the same man. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. I'm far by the sailor man. You're gonna, you can kill that slide now. Uh, did, did you hear that? Um, it's called Popeye theology, and it's, it's somehow gotten into the church. He said, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. That sound familiar? Maybe not from, from Popeye, but you've likely heard someone say this before. You've maybe thought this about yourself before. Maybe a loved one you know has bought into the lie of Popeye theology. And we often use this as an excuse when we decide that sin is easier to choose than Jesus. We say, God loves me. God loves everyone. He made me this way. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. I just need to be me. I just need to love myself the way God created me to be. It's Popeye theology, and like anything that isn't Jesus, it will lead you straight into the pit of hell. Your identity is not found in who you think you are. Your identity is not found in how you feel about yourself. It's only found in Christ Jesus. Yes. Colossians chapter three. If you have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen for you. Uh, we're gonna read through some of this and, 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 and kind of break it open. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. 
But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. One of my favorite preachers uh, often says, Jesus didn't come to save you, he came to kill you. It's a harder way to get people excited about coming to church and, and to Jesus, but, but the Bible constantly tells us that we're to die to sin, to, to our old nature. Jesus came to kill that person of who we were, and, and we die to that, and we pick up and we carry our cross, and we constantly die to self. And so when you surrender to Jesus, it's no longer about you and how you feel and what you think, but about him. Your hopes, your dreams, your desires, and your feelings become irrelevant. And if you'll center everything on Jesus, life will be incredible. Next week, we're going to baptize people in water. We're, we're going to have them come up, and, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to cheer. And, and baptism in water is for people who've made the decision to surrender their lives to Jesus, and they want to make a declaration to everyone. They want to say, hey, I want you to know that, that I have surrendered my life to Jesus. And, and in baptism, it, it's a symbol that we are buried with Christ. When, when we go under the water, we're, we're buried just like he was, and our old lives have passed away. Our sin nature has died, and when we come up out of the water, it's signifying that we have new life with Jesus. If you've not been baptized in water and, and you're here today and you know Jesus, uh, would you chat with me after the service? I'll be right here as we end. And, and if you've never been baptized in water, would you just come up and ch chat with me? I, I want to encourage you to maybe consider getting baptized next week. And, and so it's an exciting thing that we get to celebrate. And that's someone saying, my identity isn't in who I was. That is dead. I identify with Christ. And we're too wrapped up in ourselves. And, and this battle is waging our old selves versus this new life in Jesus. And, and it can cause a lot of confusion. It can cause an identity crisis. Have you asked the questions, who am I? What do I believe? How do I feel? These are difficult questions that, that we're wrestling with as we go through life and, and in our mind and in our identity as we struggle to find who are we. And, and for some of you, your identity is wrapped up in other people. What so-and-so feels about me or thinks about me gives me my worth or my self-worthlessness. It might be a family member, a spouse, a kid. Can I tell you so many people have wrapped up their lives in, in their children? But, but some of us, we're basing our identity and who we are and our value in what other people think and feel about us. For some, you can't get out of your own head. It's just your thoughts, right? You, you know about your past. You know the sins that Jesus has forgiven, but you have not forgotten all the triggers in life that, that set you right back to the old pains that you thought Jesus had taken away. Anyone ever get confused by that at some point in your life? You're like, I came to Jesus. He forgave me of all my sins. I felt amazing. It was so great. And then I got tempted by this sin. I fell back into it. And I was like, where was Jesus for all of that? I went right back to the old way. And old habits come flooding back. And, and sometimes you don't even recognize yourself. For others, you're wrapped up in things in stuff. If you can't keep up with the Joneses, you feel like you've failed. You cultivate a, a public persona for others to see and to envy, but deep down you feel empty and hollow. Some of you live life like you have a, these filters they have on social media. Uh, have you seen this form of witchcraft where people transform themselves and Right, everyone on TikTok and Instagram, they have flawless skin, the lighting's always perfect, their cheekbones are popping, and like it's just amazing. And then you see these hideous swamp creatures in real life, <laughs> and you're just like, whoa. That's not nice. We're, we're just regular people. This is just how, how we look. But right when you set a, a, a filter on and, and you 
disguise what's really going on. And, and we live life with these filters, trying to hide the, the thing underneath that, that's in our heart, right? The, this swamp creature in our heart is called sin. I remember there was a, a phase that went through, like everyone was Pixaring themselves. Do you remember this? Like people would post a picture of, of them and it would become like a Pixar character. Can I tell you, I've never seen more attractive human beings than when they were in a Pixar format. Like everyone looked incredible as a Pixar character. And, and I think we do that sometimes. We say, hey, well, well, look at me in this persona and we present a certain way to, to people, but it's not genuine to our hearts. And apart from Jesus, any place that we find our identity is going to leave you wanting more. It's going to leave you needing more. And your identity is under assault. Paul said in verse five, he said, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. If you've ever read the New Testament, you, you may be surprised by the amount of content that is dedicated to combating sexual sin. It, it's because it has great impact on us. It's because we form who we are through these sins. And, and if you look at all these churches, the church in Rome, in Corinth, in Galatia, in, uh, in Ephesus, in Colossians, in Thessalonica, all these churches get warned from letters by Paul to, to say, hey, you guys need to be careful of sexual sin. That's every single community that, that had churches that he wrote to that we have in the Bible except Philippi. And, and so I want you to understand, like, this is an issue. It was a serious, prominent issue then, and it's a serious issue now. And, and I'm sick and tired of being told that if I believe the Bible, if I, if I just read the Bible and I believe about marriage and I believe about gender and I believe about sexuality, that, that I'm full of hate, I'm tired of hearing that being the case because it's just simply not true. I'm tired of being told you're closed-minded if you think marriage is between a man and a woman. I just believe that God's design is the best and it's the only way for anyone to live life. I reject the premise that, that I'm hateful if I tell someone I disagree with their choice of lifestyle. I believe that loving God means dying to self. I believe that, that our identity isn't found in our chosen sexuality preference or, or in the gender that is, is what we choose today. Now, you know people that identify themselves as the gender they're not born with, or, or a sexuality that is, is not the way that God designed it. I, I know individuals like this as well, and their lifestyle choice doesn't mean that we hate them. It doesn't mean that we ignore them. It doesn't mean that we attack them. It doesn't mean that they're not welcome to attend this church. We love everybody just like God does, but we also care more about a person's eternity we care more about their soul than their warped sense of identity. Have you heard or have you said to yourself, I can't help it, I was born this way? It's an excuse we use for a lot of sin, a lot of habitual sin, a lot of sin that we use to form our identities. And we just, this is how I was born. I can't help it. Sometimes we take it a step further because now we're a Christian. We say, well, this is who God made me to be. I don't want to hide who God made me to be. That agenda that says you hate me if you don't accept me for how I was born is in direct opposition to the scriptures. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 3.23, I'm going to reverse the Romans road. For all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 51.5 says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We were all collectively, every single person, born in sin. One might be predisposed towards homosexuality. One might be towards stealing. One might be towards alcoholism. One towards outbursts of anger. And then maybe the environment that you grew up in fostered some predispositions to sin as well. But the Bible is pretty clear, all sin is not created equal. Now, all sin separates us from God, but there are worse consequences and effects of certain sin. 
And so many people today are wrapped up in an identity that revolves around their sexuality. Sex outside of marriage, sex outside of God's design, sex outside of God's prescription, sex with others of the same gender, lusting after others, identifying who we are based on our sexuality or gender, all of it is simply wrong and sinful. How come it's so difficult to say that today when it used to just be common sense? Now, I've already like stressed out this week, like this message is gonna go online and, and I'm concerned that if you pull a sound bite or you take a, a clip out of context that, that it could be skewed, right? Because if you remember about four minutes ago, we just said we love everyone, everyone is welcome here. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 18, Paul said, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. Paul says other sins, certain sins, are, are more devastating than, than different ones. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. That's my emphasis added. I think you see it bolded up on the screen. I want you to understand, you do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. That's what salvation is. It's recognizing this statement. It's saying, God purchased me with the blood of Jesus, and so I'm going to die to myself because I don't belong to myself anymore. And so how I felt about who I was, who I crafted my identity to be, is irrelevant in Christ Jesus. And God forgives every sin of the past. He forgives every sin that you might be struggling with today. There's no guilt from Jesus in your past. There's no shame. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He has set you free, forgiven every sin when you call on the name of the Lord. Whatever your sin is, when you call upon the name of the Lord, he sets you free and he forgives you. But ongoing, active sexual sin and the way that you view sexuality greatly impacts your identity in Christ. Choosing to live a life with intentional sin as the foundation of who you believe yourself to be is in direct contrast to what God says about who you are and who he created you to be. And he made you to be like him. He, he made you in his own image. Back to what Paul said in Colossians. He said, since you've taken off your old self with his practices, that means you were once wearing a suit of sin and you came to Jesus and you unzipped it and you, you peeled that off and you stepped out of that old life, those old practices. In verse 10 and you put on the new self, right, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of Christ. So you step into your Jesus suit and you put that on and, and, and the old you has passed away. And struggling with sin is one thing. We'll all struggle with sin. We'll all be tempted to sin, but we take off every identity that we closed ourselves with in the past. Every identity that was forced onto you by someone else, every identity that, that you labeled yourself with, and we, we lay those at the cross and we put on Jesus, the one who bought you with the blood that he shed when he died on the cross, the one who sets us free, the one who gave his life, the one who our identity needs to be founded in. This is why coming to church is so vital. It's why reading and understanding the scriptures is so important. It's why having alone, quiet time in the presence of God is so mandatory because you need to understand who God is and who you are and what he says about you so that you can form these things about yourself in him. Being with and knowing Jesus is the only way to ground your identity in Christ. It's too easy today to be led astray by, by the opinions of the world. It's hard to be different. 
when you signed up to follow Jesus, you said, I'm going to choose to go against the current. It's harder to swim against the current, but, but it fashions a strength in you when, when you do that. And, and so that's what you've chosen to do. That's what you've decided when you said, I'm going to follow Jesus. Rebecca, you can come up. I saw a story. I, I've seen a lot of stories over the years of a, a pastor who took his own life. He had a young wife, uh, three young kids, and he believed the only way out was through death. Tragic. I, I hate any time I hear a story of a pastor who's ended their life because you don't become a pastor unless your heart is to see people connect with Jesus. And so it's tragic, and we live in a society where when people need help, we bash them and we make them feel like failures, and, and they think that there's no place that they can turn. We need to be protected from that. We need to know that, that if there's no other place to turn, then at least you know I can turn to Jesus. I can turn to the people in my church. And no matter what I might be struggling with, I can go to someone. I can say, hey, I need your help. Hey, would you pray with me? Hey, would you help me get out of this? But even if there's no one with you, Jesus is. And when you form your identity in Christ, you can't get away from it. And even if you're down, and even if you're facing the, the, the most challenging things in life, you know who you are in Christ. And that protection will save you from so much spiritual attack. The lies that, that the enemy is assaulting you with can't harm you because of who you belong to. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you will prosper. What an encouraging verse. Probably one that many of you have heard before or maybe even memorized. I always read this and I think, why does it seem like the attacks of the enemy are destroying people's lives and prosperous? If the Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, why does it look like they are? Either the Bible's wrong or we're missing out on some type of protection of the Lord. And I'll just be bold today to tell you the Bible's not wrong. It's not that bold to say in a church. <laughs> but if this verse is true, which we believe it has to be, that no weapon formed against you can prosper, I, I believe that if you knew who you were based on what God says about you, if you had some scripture memorized in your arsenal, right? And, and when the enemy comes and, and you start feeling those, those voices, the, those attacks that try to bring you down and, 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 and assault you, right? When those things come, you would just use not Popeye theology, but kindergarten theology. You say, what's, what's kindergarten theology? Kindergarten theology says to the enemy, I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. You know how you, you operate with kindergarten theology is you know who Jesus is, you know who you are, and you know what the Bible has to say about those things. When we know who we are in Christ, when we base our identity in him, what he says, what the Bible says, then no weapon formed against you can prosper because you know that your Father in heaven has your back. You know what your Father in heaven says about you and believes about you, and you believe those things about yourself as well. And so what attack can the devil form to hurt you when your Father who spoke all things into existence and breathed life into this world is with you? None. He has no power. He has no authority unless you allow it in your life. And so you need to come back for the next three messages about how God operates with us, about who you are, about what God says about you and who you are in him. But I want to leave you here this morning with 
with these problems, with the challenges we're facing. I want you to leave here filled with hope and, and with a fresh start. And so we have communion. Hopefully you didn't sit on it and stain your pants today. Um, I heard some complaints about how hard it was to get the, the cellophane off the top of the last brand. So we even have a new brand today. We, we have a different identifying communion cup today. It might be worse. I... Oh, this, is, this was really easy. Just like coming to crisis. Communion does this. It resets our foundation. It causes us to go back and to think about where we're at with Jesus. What sin am I struggling with? What sin am I dealing with? It gives you the opportunity to repent of that sin, to come to the Lord and just say, God, sometimes I mess up. Thanks for not giving up on me. It reminds us to come to him and say, God, would you forgive me? And so I want you to really think this morning, and we're going to pray, and we're going to have a time of worship, but I want you to take this time today, and we're going to do communion every single week through this series, because I want us to end remembering and identifying with Jesus. This is what your identity is in, his body that was broken, that was sacrificed on the cross so that you could receive forgiveness no matter what. The only condition is that you would die to yourself, that you would receive the free gift of eternal life through salvation in Jesus and his death on the cross, but his resurrection from the grave, showing that he has the power to forgive you and and to conquer death. And so it says this in Matthew, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Would you break the bread with me? Lord, we pray right now that as we take this, as we eat this, as we remember your broken body, God, that you would bless this act of surrender, God, this act of remembrance, Jesus, of what you've done and and who we were before you. God, we were broken. We were lost. We were in dire circumstances, Lord. And you saw fit to send your son to save us. You sent your son to make a way You sent your son because you desperately love us. And God, every single one of us in here, we we tried on our own. We crafted our own identities and our thoughts and our practices. And God, we fell short every single step of the way until we found you. And so, Lord, I pray that as we share this bread, we would remember it's not about who we are, but whose we are. And God, we belong to you. Would you bless this? Remind us of how good you have been to us in Jesus' name. Let's share the bread. Then Jesus took the cup, and when given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, you know whatever sin is in our hearts. And so, God, we humbly come before you right now, grateful for the opportunity grateful for the presence of your spirit in our lives, grateful that God, anytime we've been tempted, you provided a way out. Your spirit is with us, drawing us away from sin and calling us to a life that conforms to Jesus. And God, sometimes we make the wrong choice. 
Sometimes we make the wrong decision. And so, God, it's by what this cup represents, your forgiveness, that we can be forgiven. And so, God, we bring you our sin right now. Lord, would you forgive us? God, we don't just want forgiveness. We repent. God, we bring it to you. We lay it at the cross. We cover it in your blood, and we turn from it not to return to it again. Would today be a marker in our lives where we say, my identity is in you, Jesus. It's not in the things of this world. It's not in the idolatry of self, but Jesus only in you. Forgive us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's share the cup. I want to pray one more time over you, just in general. My, my hope is that during this time, the Lord would speak to you. And worship team, if you want to come as I'm praying, then I want to invite you. Would you actually stand now? Lord, all across this room, we've shared communion, we've repented of our sins, God, in these next few minutes of worship, Lord, I just pray that we would hear your voice, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that anything that isn't pleasing to you, that we would release it, that we would give it to you, that you would remove it. Jesus, it's all about you. God, help us to be extreme in this that you are first place in all things, that we stand on your word. And if we don't know what your word says, God, would you just instill in us a hunger to read the Bible and to understand who you are and what you say? God, in this moment right now and, and as we worship, I just pray, God, that you would transform our hearts again and again. And Lord, we build our identity in who you are and what you've done. Help us now, God. Speak, we pray in Jesus' name.